So I'm Michael Liebman. I'm, I'm managing director of IPQ Analytics, and I have a couple of faculty positions as well. Um, and just by way of background, uh, my training is in theoretical chemistry. I have half academia in my background and half uh, commercial pharma. So I was global head of computational biology and genomics for Roche. Um, I was uh, also a professor of cancer biology at UPenn and pharmacology at Mount Sinai. And um, I ran a breast, I was the director of a breast center for the Department of Defense jointly with Walter Reed, where we did everything from patients, uh, surgery, oncology, pathology, genomics, proteomics, tissue banking, informatics, et cetera. And I serve on the... Um, Pharma, PHRMA, Foundation Board, uh, Advisory Board, and I chair their translational medicine program. So I, I would classify myself not as a data scientist per se, as it's used now, but as a modeler. I'll just list some of my collaborators. The project that I'm talking about today, the effort is uh, international collaboration, and you'll see potentially where some of these different collaborations come to play in, in what we're trying to do. Um, I'll start off because this is COVID oriented with a model that um, is somewhat popular. It reflects sort of a, a summary of uh, the way we had started to think about COVID, especially back in the March timeframe. And what you see are the different uh, diagnostic stages that uh, patients were evaluated in when they, they were uh, first entering the clinic and what was assumed to be their progression from that point. Um, this was very effective and obviously critical at the time when we had very little information and was used and still is used to triage patients to a certain extent, but um, COVID is complicated, and I use St. George's quote, that all complex problems have a simple solution, and that is typically wrong. I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's inadequate because uh, a lot of the things we do are involved in looking at disease as a process and not as a state. And so these are not really adequate definitions to describe a patient uh, as we've learned and as I'll explain going forward. Um, I think, uh, David, we probably have time. If people have questions, they can interrupt. Uh, that's up to you, how you want to that's, run it. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yep. Okay. Good. So the goals of what we're trying to do is to identify and focus on critical clinical questions. So that's why I say we're modeling COVID from the clinic back. So that includes risk evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment decisions where we're focused on stratifying the disease separate from stratifying the patient. And then we want to use that to look at uh, periods of contagion and also uh, be able to improve upon what people are trying to do with contact tracing as a result. We want to enable the evaluation, incorporation and evaluation of the published literature, which I put in quotes, because obviously we have about 35% of the literature in preprint uh, which is very abnormal, but uh, reflects this, the nature of COVID. And what we want to do is be able to identify and evaluate both critical gaps and conflicts and enable simultaneously clinical researchers, clinicians, and, and public health people to actually start to evaluate hypotheses. So to do that, we think it's important to separately stratify disease and stratify patients for risk, symptoms, treatment, response, and outcome, where outcome is both short-term and long-term. The way we're doing that that I'll show you is we're developing a, what we call a top-down knowledge graph, which is based on a functional disease model, and we're developing community detection algorithms to allow high-dimension uh, data-driven analysis of the data that we're generating. So what I mean by that is from the data integration side, you can easily look at these different sources that everyone talks about. NLP can be applied, as you can imagine, uh, to 
number of these different sources. And we have a platform that um, uh, enables the data integration, but is focused, as I'll show you, in what we call a top-down functional model that incorporates a knowledge graph or uses a knowledge graph approach and some advanced analytics with a lot of different applications. Now, the typical flow in this kind of system is to create the knowledge graph, we do sort of a bottom-up approach. We analyze the sources and create the concepts and relationships that formulate that graph. We're doing it in a different way. We're doing it top-down. And what that means is we're building the knowledge graph at a completely conceptual level, driven by the clinical questions and needs, and then using the data that's available from the publications to populate that knowledge graph. And I'll show you what I mean by that as we go forward. But this is based on our overall um, general approach to looking at disease, because we actually work in about 20 different diseases. So it's evolved from what I took out of pharma as being something that was missing in pharma and, and not necessarily adequately addressed even in academia. And that's recognizing that disease is a process, not a state. And so a patient will progress from risk with signs and symptoms to diagnosis, stratify that disease, come up with treatment, then you have disease-free survival, quality of life, or overall survival as, as a model. But if we look at what the healthcare ecosystem actually looks at in terms of this, what we see is each of the different groups involved in healthcare has a different view and a different set of priorities. And that's just to be expected. But the problem or the challenge is because they each have a different view, none of them are able necessarily to take advantage of the fact that we're really looking at a system. And our modeling focuses on systems and processes. So we're looking at the system of all these factors and the process by which a patient enters in to the uh, disease state and hopefully comes out of that at the other end. So the analogy I use is it's sort of like having a bunch of people all looking at different in different windows of a house and none of them necessarily recognizing that it's a house and all of them having different views. So what we've done in our uh, pre-COVID world is decide to model this process rather than the independent views. And we initiated that using an ontology-based approach. And this is what you see in a uh, top level of our ontology where this is actually totally disease agnostic. And what I mean by that is there are no elements here that are unique to a given disease. Any disease utilizes or is impacted by all of these elements, but the difference from one disease to the next is how you would weight them. So what we're really looking at is the general description of disease which gets weighted at individual factors differently for individual diseases. So what that means basically is the guidelines may be better in one disease than another, the ability to make an accurate diagnosis may vary, things of that nature. Now there's a lot of uh, things that we do that I won't show you in terms of the analytics associated with this. And as I said, this is only the top layer of what that, um, actual model of the ontology. This we've implemented, it's web-based, and we use that with our colleagues from Italy. So now let's apply that approach to COVID. And what you see is the individual pre-infection, the virus interaction, individual is infected testing and assessment, patient treatment evaluation, and then post-treatment, what that individual really looks like. And I think you probably can um, relate many of the different uh, uh, articles that are in the public press and discussed on all the TV shows, new shows, that uh, talk about the complexity of many of these different steps. So if we start to apply the model of the ontology that I showed you, just in a very simple way, you can start to see where a lot of those uh, general 
concepts and relationships are start to model into the specifics of COVID. And what we've basically done then is we've taken this process or this journey of the patient and we've segmented it into different steps. So we have these set of parameters that are factors that specifically re relate to the patient and to the virus itself. We have these which relate to the signs, symptoms, and diagnostic procedure. I don't know why Brianna's in here. Um, we have this relating to treatment and response and this relating to outcome. And so I'll just show you this part of the um, uh, approach to give you an idea of how we go into depth and then uh, apply some of the analytics. So if we expand that, what we're looking at are the individual pre-infection and the virus. And if we look at the individual, we have to look at risk assessment of that individual, which comprises at least these terms. Now in our general model, there are more terms involved, but in terms of our initial view of COVID, these are the main factors. We look at something like social determinants of health. Um, you can see number of factors that are involved. Comorbidities, uh, we'll talk about that in terms of risk of an individual, and then the medications associated with that, the genomics, both of the individual and the genomics of the virus, then the geographic distribution and environment and lifestyle. And so you can start to see how this builds out uh, at a conceptual level into a, a higher degree of complexity. But I'll show you that this is just barely touching the surface of what we've built into the knowledge graph. So if we take an individual pre-infection and we have started to look at these, of course, when we're looking at the individual's genomics, we're looking at both immune-related genes as well as non-immune specific genes. And then we're looking at the comorbidities of those patients. Now these happen to be a number of the comorbidities that have been studied to some extent of patients, but this is a very sparse set of data. And what we're really trying to do by doing a top-down approach is build a completely generalized, non-biased um, uh, knowledge graph that we then populate with the literature. And what that allows us to do is see what characteristics were not defined in different publications. Uh, in other words, what we would call a gap where you may get different re uh, results or observations uh, coming out of a study without knowing how to do direct comparison. Also, you may get conflicts between data sets or results from different studies. And again, what we're trying to do is enable uh, the deep dive to go in in an unbiased way, and but a directed way to understand what may or may not be present uh, between different studies. When we talk about then comorbidities, we have to talk about the medications. These are the medications that have typically been um, monitored with regard to COVID, but this gives you a different profile. These are the most likely medications that are prescribed in the population in general. And as you can see, a majority of these are not actually incorporated in many of the studies that are being done. So what we're really trying to get at is, what does the population really look like in the general characteristic um, before they get infected? And where uh, or how do some of these parameters match, uh, actually uh, have a, a potential uh, relationship with how the patient will present and to show you what I mean, this is what we've done analytically. This is the impact of comorbidities in polypharmacy or taking more than one drug. So if we look at this side of the model, and disease is a process that evolves over time, what we know is that a patient or patients that present at different points in the disease may actually be diagnosed differently, even though they're on one disease path. And the fundamental reason for that is we've never, except in very, one very, very uh, uh, 
an ethical study allowed a patient to progress in a disease just through observation without treating those patients. And so the mathematics of doing this require us to know both the dimensionality of this vector of a disease process, where a patient is along that vector, and actually also how rapidly that patient's progressing. That's just a fundamental definition of what diagnosis should be. And what that does mathematically is that converts into what we would call a tensor. And of course, we don't have the data to support that. I could give you a whole lecture on the mathematics involved in this, but the important thing to understand is if this patient has a comorbid condition or is taking more than one drug, every aspect of the diagnosis, treatment, and response will be perturbed. And it's very rare that patients come in with less than three or four comorbid conditions, but we're not adequately actually monitoring that. And not only is it important to know um, what comorbid conditions may be, even if they've been treated, but we also need to know what were the order of the comorbid conditions. And this is, again, starting to stretch beyond the level of where a lot of the data is that's been collected. But a clinician working with clinicians will tell you these are very important factors. They're just sources of data that we aren't currently bringing into the uh, typical studies that we're doing now or the publications that are coming out. So now let's just start to expand that. So this list of comorbidities actually can easily be seen that a respiratory condition is very different, whether it's asthma, COPD, or pneumonia, even heart failure, we have preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. Hypertension, which is one of the areas that, that's frequently addressed, has multiple different sources and involves kidney at different levels. And one of the concerns we have are patients who progress to acute kidney injury. But we don't necessarily, because I'm on the AKI uh, subgroup, we don't actually collect adequate data necessarily to define the patient uh, status before they actually contracted COVID. And then diabetes, of course, simply there's type one and type two differences. So you can start to see that the complexity is extremely high in terms of what data should be or could be collected. And of course, we're never going to be at the point where all the data is collected. But one of the things we try to do with our modeling is focus on being transparent about what data we are collecting, what data we're not collecting, and what the potential impact is of the data that's not incorporated. And again, as I said, with comorbidities and co-occurrence of diseases, it's important to know orders of how these conditions are occurring. At this level, we're, we know that uh, there's interaction between respiratory, cardiovascular, and kidney disease frequently. And part of the question is, what were the order of events and the dependencies of those different conditions? If we now just turn to social determinants of health, and here I'm using pretty much, well, actually this comes out of the CDC guidelines, not the NIH guidelines, as the 12 main factors. What does that really look like? Well, this is what it looks like. There are a number of subcategories or subfactors that need to be evaluated to really define what these mean. And again, we're not going to get to the level of resolution where we're collecting this data, but we need to know what are the factors that could have an impact on the patient at different levels of the disease. And again, just by way of reminder, we're building an infrastructure in our model and our knowledge graph that we're applying to COVID, but really is a generalized approach that we use in the 20 different diseases we look at. And as I said, factors in here may weight very differently in some of the other diseases than they do in COVID. And so what are the next steps of where we are and where we're going? We're trying to use this top-down knowledge graph approach to create the nodes of the graph based on those elements that I'm showing you. Then using the literature, both reviewed and preprint, we are using those to generate the edges or the weights of the graph and also incorporate confidence levels 
depending on whether it's peer reviewed or not peer reviewed, et cetera. We're working on a community detection algorithm, which we've already implemented and validated in a quantum computing environment that is large enough to accept the scale of the data we're talking about. And that enables us to stratify the disease at different stages of both of risk disease presentation, as well as response to treatment and outcome. And so we can use that community detection algorithm to both group the disease based on presentation or symptoms, things of that nature, or patients based on previous history and things of that nature. And so it's enabling us um, to much more directly be able to analyze uh, from the data that's available uh, some critical factors that come into play for clinical decision support and treatment um, uh, and guideline development. And this knowledge graph approach represents a learning system because as we uh, are actually applying it in some of our other disease areas, what we're doing is uh, enabling the, uh, the graph to continue to evolve. And that's the internal platform we're using across the 20 other diseases that we study. So um, I think that was about 20 minutes. And um, if any of you are interested, I'm happy to pursue that further directly or with questions. Interesting. <laughs> I, I, Victor here, I have one quick question. So the sort of edges um, that, you, that you are proposing, uh, they have some, if I understand correctly, some something to do with causality. So it, let's say there are, there is a node which is, uh, I don't know, infection uh, with, uh, or the, the disease having a particular disease, for example, COVID-19, and there's a node having another disease, for example, uh, or some other condition, some a kidney failure, whatever. And then you have an edge that says for this patient in particular, the first thing uh, the first thing to happen was COVID, and for the other per, uh, patient, the first thing to happen was the kidney failure. Is did I understand that correctly? Um, yeah. Well, initially, what we're enabling is mapping of the literature to show where studies are that incorporated that kind of information, so that when you're looking at a patient, you can obviously more directly. Um, reference what studies might be directly applicable to the patient you're looking at. But uh, it also raises the questions then as to um, asking those questions about the patient that you're now trying to treat. That uh, because of the literature that's available, it, it may be important, and we actually use this to help design uh, new studies uh, by identifying what questions should be asked because of the potential importance in deriving some of these relationships. So yes, you are populating it with the observations from the published studies, and then you're looking at patients to understand what factors might be critical um, based on those observations. Okay, but th then I allow me to rephrase the question. So if there is a study that says, uh, COVID causes severe kidney failure. And then there is a second study that says uh, se uh, severe kidney failure is more uh, prevalent in patients with COVID-19. Then there would be two different types of edges between this? Yes, there would be. There, there would be an edge that relates them, but the population of the edge um, would would be impacted by which occurred first. Thanks. Yeah, the order is critical. Hi, right, Michael. Mm -hmm. This is Guoqi. I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I think this is uh, a very ambitious project. I think uh, basically you you develop uh, a high level ontology trying to. Uh, populate ontology based on uh, the, the the data from literature and maybe clinical data. 
So my question is that in order to enable those data population, what kind of data standards uh, have been used uh, in your ontology to annotate those different uh -huh. Uh, data types. What what kind of well? So, for example, that? standard yeah. vocabularies. Uh, for example, for conditions, uh, are you uh, do you use any? For example, ICD code or SNOMAN CD code or well, medication? We, we, are you using any? Yeah, we reference ICD codes, but we in our analysis do not use ICD codes because of what their purpose is. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they were not developed to model disease, okay? Um, and therefore, defining phenotypes based on ICD-9, 10, whatever codes, a physician will tell you is not, not adequate. They're not so, adequate descriptions of disease. So uh, are you going to create your own vocabulary List yeah. or yeah. well, and, yeah. and it's the dynamic list, yeah. Yeah, I think the challenge would be uh, if you want to populate data from, for example, literature or uh, whatever other uh, data sources, if you don't have uh, standard codes to communicate, uh, I think it, it, it will come come with some challenge. Uh, but well, it's actually the reverse. My, my, my opinion, my opinion it, it's those... the reverse of what you're asking, because what you're finding is that you may have two papers that talk about the importance of kidney disease, say before someone contracts COVID, but one uses a clinical definition of kidney disease, and the other is using an ICD-10 code for kidney disease, and so the fact that you have a conflict in the observation of the results, that's telling you that it could reside in how they were defining who has kidney disease rather than being a conflict in the actual observations. You see what I mean? So basically the approach you are going to take is just doing manual review of those uh, published data. And is that we're actually uh, working with we're, we're actually working with some NLP groups on that analytics. Hey, it's, this is Mark. Yeah, can I ask a quick question here? I think it's relevant. So I'm wondering, you know, there are existing ontologies for disease and human phenotypes like Mondo and HPO. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they're not going to be complete, and especially for something new like COVID. But would mm -hmm. you consider be using some piece of existing knowledge like that to integrate and then build oh, upon that? Of course, of course. We're looking at comparing them uh, rather or, or enhancing the resolution of them, just like I was saying uh, kidney disease is not, not, you know, even if you go back to um, what you see is there are codes for different types of hypertension. Yes. Okay. So, so, we're not, we're not trying to um, do away with what is standard, but we're trying to enhance the resolution of what is standard and be able to um, allow analysis to um, be made that can recognize that there could be limitations with some of those standards. That's right. And I guess in particular, one thing that stood out for me was the, the what, I've, what I've seen in existing knowledge sources, they don't model disease progression or stages that well, or right. at all. So, yes. Right. Exactly. That's why a fundamental part of what we do is modeling disease is a process, not a state. So, so then I guess I have to wonder, do you have access or can you get access to, you know, the kind of sequential time uh, of phenotypes or symptoms, right? Because I think if you have that. Well, we do it uh, again, um, as I pointed out, this is a fundamental set of approaches that we've applied to 20 diseases. And it depends on the disease as to what the resolution of data is we have access to. So an example is um, we're actually measuring, um, we have a 
parallel, uh, uh, independent study using the same structure, looking at prematurity and the development of um, post-birth rare disease risk during fetal development, where we're incorporating data that's monitored during the pregnancy. So each, each disease, um, again, is, uh, or each problem area that we tackle in a disease is always going to be constrained by what data is available. And using the knowledge graph, it also points to where we need to look for other data. So yes, um, in, some, we, we, in, in our relationship with the Italian government, we actually are working with a group that has access to a very large population. So, uh, Michael, if, this is David. If I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like this could be quite useful in helping to guide uh, data collection for research purposes. Well, we use it for that as well. Yeah. Gaps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, this is question. I have another question because you you model. Uh, this in patient level, <clears throat> when you populating data from, for example, pub published paper, mm -hmm. you ended up with data from a population or cohort. How how do you handle those data? What do you mean, a population or cohort? Yeah, uh, I think the, the the results from a published paper are mostly from a population of patients, not mm -hmm. a single patient, but from right. your ontology, you, you model that in individual level, right? Well, we so can model it, yeah, we can model it at the individual level or a cohort level, where in the cohort, we're talking about, again, how the cohort was defined. So, so you, so do, do you have a component uh, for we've population this, or cohort? Yeah, we, we've used this as an example, um, in a heart failure project uh, where we took the diagnostic criteria for heart failure. And what we showed was by applying this with the data that that actually had five different subpopulations that they didn't recognize based on the cohort definition they used. That's why we're using the community detection algorithms to, to start to take those cohorts apart to understand what are the stratified subpopulations that are in those cohorts. Okay, so if I understand correctly, Victor here again, um, the community detection algorithms, uh, I mean, they operate on graphs. So you have a graph set mm -hmm. of nodes and edges and it, uh, they return subgraphs. They say this subgraph is a community. This set of nodes is a community. In Correct. this example, what would be the nodes in the graph uh, on which communities are detected? Well, in, in this, it would be, a, the simple example could be the um, ordering of comorbid conditions and the treatments that were applied to each of those subconditions. Okay, so uh, so they're like ordered pairs of treatment comorbidity, something like this. Well, they're higher order because we're not restricting it to pairs. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So so for instance, if you look at as I said here, we take hypertension, and then um, ACE and ARBs are used for hypertension as a simple example. There's a difference on the type of hypertension is the difference of whether you're getting an ACE or an R because they have different mechanisms. Okay, okay, okay. But then this... Uh, and then the so, question is, is that hypertension, while we may have kidney disease and, and heart disease noted here, were there other factors involved that are also comorbid conditions? <clears throat> 
Okay, thanks. I maybe have one fun question at the end. Is do, Michael, do you think that, that we could somehow replace or you know significantly enhance the testing we have now to do you know, surveillance by symptoms without a PCR test? Without a PCR test? Yeah. Um, I I think. Well, I'll, I'll give you an. Let me back up to this because this is one of the things that we're actually involved in. So the concern we had was when is someone actually contagious versus when they s present with symptoms. And we don't know that. And, you know, right now, um, one of the issues is uh, that people talk about is the, the problem with contact tracing. Well, it's very different if you have to contact trace for an individual two days before they show symptoms versus five days versus 14 days. And if we don't have an idea of when they're contagious, we don't know how far back you have to go because the, the one observation is it may take 14 days to show symptoms. And so what we're trying to do in the stratification is get a better handle on what that contagion period might be based on how an individual presents to understand where contact tracing uh, really needs to be uh, implemented or prioritized. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I, I like this figure a lot. It's very compelling. But again, you know, this, this is based on sort of triaging a patient when they show up. And, you know, the reality in our world is, um, well, I guess, for, the reality in our world is that you're dealing with, um, this. And so you're dealing with a moving target that you're trying to assess. That's right. That's right. You know, I, I guess I've heard of all these uh, uh, mobile app-based efforts where people can enter symptoms and even keep a log, right? Yes. And it's hard to get access to that, but I guess that would be another stream of data that sounds interesting for you. And maybe then once you have a collection of symptoms and a new one appears, all of a sudden, probabilistically, you're in this regime of, you know, being likely. Yeah. Uh, that's some of the data we have with our Italian colleagues. Cool. Well, very interesting, Michael. Yeah, I have another question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Hi, uh, Michael. So in terms of the ontology development, how many people are involved in the development? And uh, what has is there expertise? It varies um, because we have clinical people, we have ontology people all involved. Because um, again, our goal is to drive it from clinical questions back. And a lot of what we do, not just in COVID, but in most of the diseases we're working in, is we spend time our focus is really working with clinicians to help them. And, and the phrase I use, this is the phrase I use. It's very easy to consider what we call unmet clinical needs, but it's very hard to figure out what are unstated unmet clinical needs. And most clinicians are um, focused on asking you questions that they think you can answer and that sometimes does not allow them to get to the real questions that they need to ask, if that makes sense. And, and a lot of what we do is focused on that. In other words, our, our activities um, is really focused on um, working with clinicians to help identify what are the real questions that should be asked not necessarily the questions that are commonly asked. 
And so, you know, in the AKI subgroup, as an example, even though we have nephrologists who are very focused on acute kidney injury, they weren't as uh, focused and, and partially because the data may not have been available to start to drive back earlier to understand the complexity of the patient before they actually contracted COVID and kidney involvement or cardiac involvement. And yet those could be extremely valuable in helping further stratify the patient, their response or susceptibility to treatment and then progression to acute kidney injury. Does that help you? Oh, yes. So uh, is the ontology public available or just used uh, within your research team? At, at this point, it's still evolving, so we haven't made it publicly available. Okay. Do you plan to? Uh, probably at some point. I mean, the goal of the overall program, as I said, you know, we're working in 20 diseases, and the, the, what we're building is applicable across all 20 diseases. So we're really trying to make it a, a cohesive and comprehensive effort and obviously um, at some point be able to have other people contribute as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Very interesting work and glad that you uh, had this opportunity to share it with us. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you Mike. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.